All right, it's four o'clock. It's time to get started. I uh, I'm happy to see Paul right, with us. Oh man, I always forget to turn my stinking volume started. down. Oh man, I don't like my own voice that much. Don't need to hear it echoing around. I've always got it pulled up on two different places, two different bandwidths, so I know that it's connected. All right, I've I've had so many issues. It's just good to, to double check. Anyway, I want to uh, say howdy to Paul, who's joining us from England. I or uh, yeah, yeah, London. If London's not England, what is England really? So I, I got the prayer book you sent me. I haven't looked through it yet, but I appreciate it. It was really fun getting something from out of the country. Uh, DJ from Texas, so glad to to have you with me. Lewis on Facebook, one of the few very good. And then DJ, oh, yeah, same DJ. Please explain again or put links up showing up how we can donate. Okay, yeah, uh, let's start off that way. Um, if, if you're a first-time person here, you, you probably aren't. There are only 22 with us on YouTube right now, and then I, I don't even know how many on Facebook. But uh, if, if somebody watches this later and uh, you haven't seen anything that I do, my whole thing is uh, I'm a conservative, Methodist, old-school uh, looking through different topics of the day through that lens and hopefully making sense of it for a lot of people that have found the whole setup uh, intimidating and weird. So, um, yeah, let's talk about how you can support the project that I'm a part of. Let's see, here's the reading page. Um, here's Locals. This is what Locals looks like, and this is how you can support me if you want to. This is just Locals.com, and you can uh, create a Locals account, which has, I don't think you have to give any information you don't want to, but um, if you follow Plain Spoken on there, you just search for all one word, Plain Spoken, in the search field. It'll take you to me, and uh, I'll have unique content up there just for supporters. So I, I, I record stuff for supporters, and then you can choose to give a one-time gift. You can choose to give every month. I think it's great to choose to give every month. I think it's great to choose anything. You can also go um, to, let's see if I can do this while we're on air. Go to nowatamethodists.org. That's my church's website. Giving. What about, does it have the link to Tithely on there? Give online. Yeah, if you do that down at the bottom, it'll take you to a dialogue. And then you can give to Plain Spoken right here. You see that in the top right? So if you want to give through my church and get a tax rebate for it, you can do that as well. Isn't that interesting? I don't know why I haven't shown you all that before. Um, so yeah, let's just go down the line of um, who, who I am online and how things are going. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel. That's probably the most impressive platform that I'm on. Uh, we passed two and a half thousand subscribers yesterday, I think, and so that that pleases me. I uh, I didn't put out a lot of um, premeditated content this week. I did have an interview with my new president pro tempore, and I felt really good about that. I I, I hope to interview eventually or have conversations with. Uh, all the new presidents pro tempore. So um, anyway, it's going to be a good working relationship between him and me. A lot of people have said good things about that and what they got out of that conversation. Um, I also did a thing reporting on a confrontation I had with my former bishop, and a lot of people assumed it was, uh, you know, sour grapes, nastiness. I don't think it was. You know, I acknowledged a lot of things he could have done to hurt me and, and didn't, and, but things that I learned from the confrontation that I thought would be useful for other people who were either trapped inside or who are trying to figure out how to be in whatever denominational body that you're in. And then um, it hasn't been received really well. Only 336 people have viewed it for some reason. But Ken DeCreasy Dean um, wrote this book, Almost Christian, several years ago, over 10 years ago, about youth ministry and how um, youth have been inculcated in a counterfeit Christian faith. Uh, and her, her argument made a lot of sense to me, really liberated me from how I was uh, indoctrinated to do youth ministry. And so I had been wanting to talk to her for 10 years and she was, fine. She was gracious enough to accept my invitation and she was a delightful person to talk to. So you should consider watching that. And then... Um, 
I don't know if I wanted to. Okay, I was just gonna on. I finally passed eight hundred followers on uh, Facebook. That's what that is. So <laughs> I've been mystified. My local church has done uh, had an easier time getting followers on Facebook than than plain spoken for some reason. Uh, but anyway, I'm I'm really grateful for the support on uh, YouTube. So uh, anyway, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about today. Let me look at the comments real quick. Um, Mike and Marianne Hunter, glad to have you guys. And then Richard, retired UM clergy. Oh yeah, I had things that I was going to talk about before we got into Carcano. I did a, um, a live stream every evening this week as soon as the Carcano trial started. I think it was only three. Yeah, I only did three. The first evening, oh man, was I against Carcano. Second evening, I wasn't so sure. And then the third evening, I think I came down on, I mean, it, it's it's easy to say everybody was wrong. Yeah, I think that's a cop out. So in the end, you know, it, it seemed to me that, you know, almost certainly Carcano had not done perfectly and had stepped out of bounds in some ways. But it, what was more clear to me was that this did not seem exceptional. You know, I've, I've studied a lot of bishops at this point, and she did not seem to behaving, be behaving exceptionally. It really has felt strange to me that she got kicked out for 19 months. So anyway, uh, not kicked out, suspended. So anyway, I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit more, but that's kind of dominated my week. So uh, I'm, I'm probably going to spend the bulk of my time on that, but there's a ton of other things to talk about. I kind of wanted to... Um, Okay, Richard said, all Western Christians seem to be going to apostasy. <laughs> I, would, I would not disagree with you. Um, you know, I'm always warned against painting with a broad brush, but sometimes a broad brush applies. Uh, Howard says, hi, from Central Kentucky and the new Mid-South. He said Miss-South, but it's Mid-South uh, GM Conference. So very good to see you. Oh, Paul wants to know, how can you watch online Sunday services from No Wada? Um, yeah, anyone who wants to worship me on any, with me on any given Sunday, we worship at 11 a.m. Uh, Central Time in Oklahoma, and then we keep up the live stream afterwards, so you can always check on what we're doing afterwards, but all you need to do is get on YouTube and search No Wada Methodists, or Methodist. Yeah, no what a Methodist. It'll take you right to our page and then just go to our live videos. And man, we have every worship service going back probably four years at least. Maybe maybe just three. I don't know. We've been doing it a while. So I don't I don't think we do anything super special, but I think we are a super special fellowship. I don't think the specialness comes through on screen because I don't see how it could. Uh, but we've we've got a fantastic church here. And my, my preaching is just plain and simple. I don't put my sermons on here because that's not what people are on plain spoken for. But if anybody uh, is, is taking a break from their church, they're just getting a reset, they're trying to figure out what they're about, you're very welcome for a time to worship with me and my people. Well, I say that I, I should be very clear. I think worshiping online is like watching a fireplace on a screen. I just I don't think it can possibly translate, but if you're interested in kind of the form and content of the worship service that, that I design and, and happily participate in, you're, you're very welcome to join me. Yeah, you can see them live online, Paul. Uh, the, we, we live stream it. So, um, And I, I'm usually pretty good about checking the comments on Facebook, uh, but not on YouTube. And, and I, I should find a way to, to look at both of them, but I, I'm never thinking of that on Sunday morning. I'm always overwhelmed. Oh, uh, Duncan, got back from New Room. How was it, brother? Write up a, a short paragraph for people to read about New Room. I've seen the pictures. It looked fun. Uh, Howard says, hi, from Central... Con uh, oh, no, wait, I already read that. Um, DJ, thank you for your kind words. I, I enjoy our simple worship service. All right, um, so I was going to read an email that I got this week. I'm not going to read the name because I didn't ask to get permission to, but... I just, this sort of thing is exactly why I do this channel. Um, so I got this email two days ago. Uh, it says, just wanted to drop a note of thanks. Your show has been inspiring as you have presented things even-handedly and with grace. Background. 
my wife is a former UMC, now GMC pastor. We met in seminary. I grew up UMC and had no desire to be a UMC pastor due essentially to UMC politics. In parentheses, I've stayed in youth ministry until recently. I am now serving two GMC churches as full-time pastor and will be ordained in November by Bishop Jones. We've been in her current ministry setting for over a year. I've had my setting since July 1st of this year. The point, this is relevant because her church becoming GMC, like the many experience, experiences your podcast has shared, wasn't an easy process. Your podcast has helped us maintain perspective. It has reminded us that we are part of a theologically Wesleyan family and still thinks, that still thinks that orthodoxy matters. It has addressed very relevant issues through the previous many months. Also, I appreciate the long-form interviews you've done recently with my friend Jordan McFall and past ones with the Jones and many others. Keep up the good work. We're praying for your ministry and look forward to possibly meeting you this November. So I'm going to remember this guy's name that I'm not telling you, and I'm going to look forward to meeting you too this November. Thank you for sending that very kind message to me. All right, let's um, let's potentially. Okay, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read over an article from a progressive named uh, Cynthia Astle. This will be um, setting up my kind of. It, it needs to be kind of for the time being my final analysis of what happened to Bishop Carcano, because uh, she's a United Methodist bishop. I don't want to look like someone who's obsessed with her, but I'd reported on her twice before the trial happened, and it seems to me to be tied into the undercurrent of whatever's happening in the United Methodist Church, but it's it's not clear to, to hardly anybody watching it what actually happened, why it happened. Um, the, the thing that Astle... Well, actually, I don't know that Astle wrote this. This is on her website, uminsight.net, um-insight.net. Uh, but it says it's an editorial, so ostensibly it was written by somebody else. But whether it was her or somebody else, they saw that what she was accused of, the particular things that she was accused of, were not really that extreme or exceptional. Um, there are things like this that other bishops do all the time. Why is it that she was brought up on these charges, immediately removed her, from her position, suspended, and then kept suspended for 19 months despite clear language in the Book of Discipline. If you saw my conversation with Lonnie Brooks, which if you haven't, you really should. It was, it was a lovely conversation. He's a lovely man. We, of course, see things very differently in some important ways, but a very fair and rational thinker. He, he, he offered a corrective to me saying it wouldn't have gone this long if she hadn't petitioned the Judicial Council. That's probably true but it still shouldn't have gone this long. You know, it, it's dragged out. It's wasted all kinds of money. This church trial cost easily over $100,000, probably more than double that. Um, so why is it that she got in trouble to this degree when no other bishops do? One answer from the left would be she's two strikes minority. She's a woman and she's a Latina. So... That's why if it was a white male, it wouldn't have happened. Now, I obviously don't agree at all. I, I don't think that race and sex are... I'm not going to say that they're, they don't figure into the way people see others at all. That's clearly not true. But to imagine that these are large, important drivers, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Rather, I, I, the world that I live in, people they are treated like shells, sort of. When they talk about diversity on the left, that they want faces and voices and skin colors to all be different, but they want everybody to believe the same. So she fell out of lockstep. Here's been my theory. It's not that she's Hispanic or Latina. It's that she fell out of lockstep with the far left orthodoxy in different ways, and so they had to get her. But um, a, a few days ago, when in doing analysis, I slipped up by using the word integrity. Um, there are ways in which I think Bishop Carcano probably had integrity that a lot of bishops don't. But um, the irony of this whole case was that they were leaning strongly on a book of discipline 
that everybody in the courtroom, to one degree or another, had spat upon and disrespected whenever they said flat out as a jurisdiction that they were not going to abide by the sexual ethics of the Book of Discipline. So um, let's get into the actual article. I'll read whatever, whoever the author is, I'll read what they say. It's not a long article, and then I'll, I'll give my corrective. Uh, now that the testimony is over and the jurors are sequestered in deliberation. Okay, so this was before the final decision this morning. It's easy to say the heretofore unspeakable. Had Minerva G. Carcano been a white male bishop, she never would have been brought to trial. Not one whit of testimony from the complainants or their supporting witnesses demonstrated any attitudes or behaviors that haven't existed among Methodist bishops since Francis Asbury rode the circuits of pioneer America. The difference is that whatever occurred over the time of the complaints, the behaviors brought to light at last, sadly, have not been rare among past Episcopal administrations. Not one bishop who has exhibited such behaviors has been brought up on charges in the past, even when clergy didn't learn of their yearly appointments until annual conference. And this is all true, by the way. It used to be the norm, actually, that, that clergy didn't learn of their new appointments until like the last day of annual conference. They would come to annual conference with all their belongings packed up and in a carriage ready to go. That was just the culture of early pioneer America. Hardly anyone ever stayed at an appointment for uh, longer than a year. Um, that's perhaps not a helpful thing to point out. Bishops have, until very recently, always used appointments to punish rogue clergy, giving them appointments that not many people wanted, uh, and then giving cushy appointments to those whom they like or have served the conference. That's still very much the case. There are churches in conferences that are known to be the places where DSs go to retire. They pay well. They don't uh, push too much. Um, so, yeah, the, this has been common, but the thing it's not saying here is that early Methodist leadership was decisively authoritarian. John Wesley was authoritarian. Francis Asbury was authoritarian, even those who weren't bishops. You know, and John Wesley wasn't a bishop, uh, technically. But even those who were just given leadership in various areas, they didn't participate in dialogue and open discussion or collaboration. These are all very new concepts of leadership, and they don't seem to be working particularly well, at least if the standard is getting large groups of people to move together in the same direction, which would seem to be necessary for group cohesion and group flourishing. If you don't do that, if you don't have a common vision that everybody's moving towards, whether they're being poked from behind or beckoned from the front, then people are going to spread out and do whatever they want, and a general malaise is going to set in. And it seems to me that that's what was happening in Cal Nevada, was that you had a bunch of people used to doing things their own way, and that uh, Carcano discerned that it was her job to unify, call people around herself, and as a leader, lead them. So here's that's just a theory. I, I've only spoken to a few people on the ground there. They say radically different things from one another. So it, it, it's clear to everybody from the outside it was a dysfunctional environment. Let's get back into the article. Let us be clear, soft-spoken, demure, and devoted to God and Christ's church, Bishop Carcano is no spotless saint. Like every human, she has had bad days and short tempers, misunderstandings and thoughtless remarks, and big mistakes. Nothing in this editorial condones bad behavior on the part of any supervisors, but we know it occurs. If her behavior has been as bad as alleged in the complaints against her, how was she elected a bishop? Uh, the answer to that is there are a lot of people who stood in her way, and she still got her way. Um, a very cynical conservative response would be she checked the Hispanic and the female boxes, and there aren't many of those, so you elevate the ones that you've got. I actually don't know that that's the reason. I don't know. She's she's very charismatic in a certain way that not many United Methodist clergy in particular are. It's really hard to say, but I, I do know that um, even people who knew her before she became a bishop have raised concerns. So that's not to say that they're true. I think partly what I said on yesterday's live stream was people operate with the uh, constructs or the, the stereotypes that they have. Um, when we meet a new person or when we're looking at a public persona, 
we there's no way that we can create a nuanced picture of them in our heads. Rather, we rely on stereotypes and caricatures in order to like fit them into a box so we know how to process their words. And in America, you know, how many examples of strong women do we have? You got like Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> Doesn't look great, you know, it's hard to process. Uh, you got Michelle Obama, who's liked by more, but not a lot more. You know, there, there are not many boxes to, to fit into. All of a sudden, I sound super progressive. Anyway, all that to say, Carcano, I think, fit into a certain box that was easy to disregard, especially if she wasn't always leaning on group consensus, but like insisted on moving forward, which it's clear that she did. You know, all of a sudden, she's trampling on people's feelings, and uh, this, this lady's got to go. Anyway, back to the article. Even though described as a woman of two books, the Bible and the Book of Discipline, she also had been, has been a visionary whose inclination to seek collaboration, inclusion, and innovation explodes the little boxes in which church professionals like to hoard their power. These qualities make her a tremendous threat to entrenched movers and shakers. So this is something that I've said in so many words. The Cal Nevada Annual Conference of the UMC is no different than at any other human institution. It's run by humans who want to conserve their power to decide their own fates and that of others, even when that power proves toxic. Witnesses themselves testified that tensions, especially in the conference office in West Sacramento, have been building for years. To whatever extent Bishop Carcano contributed to the escalation of those tensions, she has been severely and publicly punished for her part in the rupture by the UMC's own legal process, even before a verdict is rendered. So there's a lot to say about that. Um, all right, so I'll go back to the main screen so we get some variety here. Um, one is, this is obviously true. People like having control of their own destinies, and they're willing to really hurt others sometimes in order to maintain control. I tried to send Bishop Carcano an email today after the verdict, several hours after the verdict, and I got an email back from the bishop's office saying, Bishop Carcano is not getting emails here anymore. Uh, you can send them to uh, Bishop Sanofsky, or you can uh, also email her administrative assistant, Mike, here. Mike was one of the people who testified against her, and I just couldn't help but wonder, what's Mike going to do now that in front of you know, however many thousands of people watched that, said that she was um, uh, abusive. No, he didn't use that word. He said that she harassed him uh, after she got suspended. And it was just clear that he had contempt for her. And I just can't help but wonder what's going to happen as she reenters the Episcopal office and you have this treasurer that filed complaints against her um, and has been there for decades. And you have this administrative assistant, her direct assistant to the bishop. <laughs> it's just going to be so awkward. Why would these people take this risk? I think, one, it's, yeah, there are these dynamics of wanting to maintain one's own power and position and security, and it was clear that she was mixing things up. But two, it also seems to me that somewhere along the line, they got pretty sure that this was a sure deal. I think someone offered them assurances that, that this was going to go through, and I'm wondering if heads are going to roll now. Of course, not literally, but, uh, man, what's going to happen in the next few days and weeks? Um, what else did I want to say about this? Oh, that it was, I, I don't think I said this last night. One of the weirdest things about this trial was that the propriety of Bishop Carcano's conduct hung heavily upon the words of the conference chancellor, who assured her that the concerns of the special CFNA committee that was formed against her and the HR committee um, that, that got soured, that they were not based on anything real and that she was just fine, not just with American law, but with conference policy regarding nepotism and all this. So that's on the grounds of what this chancellor said. She called things to an end and insisted on moving forward. They never called the conference chancellor in as a witness on either side. And I don't know if they didn't summon him or if he refused to come or what, but it seemed really weird. Also, the lack of follow-up 
on accusations. There would be one thing said on one side that couldn't be reconciled on the other side, and then it was like there was a collective shrug, like, well, I guess we'll never know, as if you can't ask more questions or, you know, um, something else I knew I wanted to say today. Um, Bishop Gwynn, he was the presiding uh, uh, one running the whole show. He said, we've got to do better than this. There's got to be a better way. And this is something that I've just noticed about the United Methodist Church in particular. They find something really unpleasant that's indicative of, of an underlying sickness, and then they just blame its exposure for the nastiness, not acknowledging that, that something's really gone awry. And so they just blame the system rather than the underlying condition, which I find really unfortunate because you're misdiagnosing what the issue is. But also, it, it is worth asking. It's not enough to go, something's wrong with this. We've got to do better. Like, do better is not anything worth saying ever. <laughs> you know, if all you got to say is do better, just keep your mouth shut. That's just not a helpful thing to say. But a realistic solution, man, I started wondering today, and I wonder how seri or silly this sounds to people, but it'd be really nice just to have private investigators if a private investigator had gone and interviewed these people privately, looked at emails and correspondences, verified that things were correct, this process would have looked very different. But instead, it was a bunch of grown people, many of whom making more than six figures a year, that are doing he said, she said, and crying in front of everybody. I find the whole thing kind of like infantilizing and embarrassing. Um. Let me just look at uh, comments for a minute because I've been uh, doing this for a bit. Um, is Duncan's the for that's the furthest back that yeah I think that is. All right, so he was um, talking about this conference he went to the New Room Pan Wesleyan Conference. Oh, so not just GMC Contemporary Music and Worship, good breakout sessions, good promotion of seed beds, band meetings. Um, nearly all pastors. Oh, that were in attendance. Hope GMC conferences will have more lay training. Yeah, that, that's that's in order, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Brian says the real crime is the mistrust, fears of retaliation, charges of, and counter charges, such opposite ways of interpreting brothers and sisters in unity, and the failure to focus on Jesus Christ. Well, okay, so Brian, if you watch the interview I did with Kenda Creasy Dean, what what one of the things that I hope you and anyone who watches it will notice is it's one thing to say, you know, as the song does, just give me Jesus, you know, or um, the way that Dr. Dean said, we just need to have a better Christology. But then that immediately volunteers a question, which Jesus are we talking about? And the reason the UMC division needed to happen is because we are worshiping different Jesuses. And so, unfortunately, it's not enough just to gather around the name Jesus. We need to have the same understanding of who Jesus is, and that's what's killing the UMC right now. They made this big, broad tent where people could worship all kinds of Jesuses, but there's only one Jesus. Uh, Jeff Pospisil says, hmm... There are zero white males in the Western jurisdiction. So the statement is probably technically true because Carcano would not have been elected as a white male. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> DJ says GMC Eastern Texas is holding lady training in a one-week retreat in October. Hey, that's connectionalism right there. That's a wonderful connection. Duncan, connect with DJ. Um, okay, let's get back into the article. Um, oh, no, no, no. Okay, so, well, at the end of uh, the article there, here, let's see, right? Uh, she has been severely and publicly punished for her part in the rupture of the UMC's own legal process even before a verdict is rendered. So that's something I wanted to talk about. I do think there are ways of asking questions publicly that don't immediately lead to suspicion, but it seems to me that, that Carcano was intentionally dragged through the mud so that she felt so guilty to everybody by the time she came to trial that as soon as you have this day, day and a half of people just throwing whatever they can at her to see what sticks, people have got their minds made up. So um, let's see, do I have Twitter pulled up? I do. So if you search Carcano trial, you will find a number of people made up their mind that she's guilty 
Oh, yeah, I'm not on the reading page. Sorry. A number of people have their mind made up that she is guilty no matter what the jury said, even though the jury is savvy to how the the conference works, how the discipline works. No, these people have to be wrong because I've had this personal decision that Carcagna's guilty. So uh, one says, guess what we're supposed to get out of this is that if you have uniquely bad boss who makes your life miserable and gives you bad assignments, it's non-complainable under church law. Of course, you can complain about it. You don't have to have any disciplinary provision to complain about it. The, the question is, can you file a complaint about it? And then the answer should obviously be no. If we file complaints against bad bosses, we are in bad trouble. So UM Insight is Cynthia Astell. She's the lady whose article we're reading, and she's published some decent stuff on it. Jonathan says, many of the charges were very technical, but what is clear is that Bishop Carcano regularly uses threats of charges and loss of credentials to control and to coerce, and the UMC declared that's okay. Even though I've left, I'm praying for the UMC's future. So part of the reality there is they only had evidence of her doing that once. So to say uh, that she regularly uses it is, is not great. But secondly, it's a bishop's prerogative to control the uh, appointment of the clergy under them. You know, now that's not to say they always use that control in a holy fashion or a good fashion, but to, to act as though this is something unique or strange just betrays a ba basic lack of awareness of historically how Methodism has worked and how Episcopal systems work. And if, if you don't have bishops with that authority, then you have a whole other set of problems that become decentralized and gets real weird real fast. That's not to say that's not to say anything against congregationalism, but that's just to say like I'm skeptical, cynical of people's simplicity in all this. Um, Stephen Fife regularly says things that I agree with. No matter where you are on the Carcano trial, you have to admit this is an unhealthy system. The trial information is only the tip of the iceberg stuff. The UMC system is incredibly and deeply broken. He, of course, is now an Anglican, I believe. Um, the Wesleyan Quadra Liberal. I had an exchange with them. They seemed nice enough, but they were of the mind. She was guilty, guilty, guilty. She says, uh, I don't know why I assume it's a she. I don't know if it's a male or female or non-binary. Um, not guilty on all charges, which I expected slash feared. I'm going to sit with it before saying more. My clergy and church friends are reaching out in collective pain and uncertainty for what is next. I want to witness and support that before saying more. Um, oh, and then there, this was a long thread. So anyway, I, I, there were a few more that I was hoping would come up, but they didn't, and uh, I've spent enough time on that. Let me check on comments before we move on with the article. Um, no more comments. Very good. Okay. Um, the Nawada California Nevada Annual Conference. No, wait, sorry, we're, we're another paragraph down. Nonetheless, there's an inescapable fact at the bottom of the L'Affaire Cacagno. The trial testimony made clear that the complaints brought against her were all about power and ego. Some of that ego was the bishops, but testimony showed that most rancor stemmed from church professionals seeking to defend their fiefdoms from the kind of broad-based collaboration that Bishop Carcano attempted to implement. To her credit, former District Superintendent Reverend Stacy Current blew away some of the fog in the multi-point complaints against the bishop. As another clergywoman of color with similar experiences, Reverend Current clearly understands the uphill battle faced by any clergywoman of color in authority and the exceedingly white male dominated. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Here, her testimony during the trial outshone that of every other witness not because she supported the bishop, but because she spoke truthfully without undue emotion and backed up her testimony with simple facts against her testimony. The church's case appeared contrived based on hearsay, misperceptions, misunderstandings, and in some cases, suspiciously inaccurate evidence. So it's so weird to me the way that I agree with some authors and then just fundamentally disagree. Like, I just don't think the 
the the gender ethnicity lens is a helpful lens in reviewing this stuff. Uh, I think power is a very excellent lens for looking. I think that is sufficient for this. Um, but also noting the people doing the he said, she said stuff, the people leveling the complaints and having nothing to back it up or, oh, gee, where did that order come from? Or, gee, you know, I know this was said. I know she said it, but I can't tell you when. You know, that sort of stuff um, was only on one side. And then the tears were only on one side and the hysterics were only on one side. And um, Carcano and Current, I mean, they had emotion. They weren't automatons. They weren't stoic, but also they were in control of their emotions. And that goes a long way with me. Uh, Paul says, uh, from a European perspective, Latinos are white. I don't know if you can say that in America. Um, of course, I'm kind of joking, but uh, that's that's an interesting... I, I would be... In, really, they are white? Okay, let's do it. Uh, Lewis says, the UMC seems not to be white male dominated, more that white males are a dying breed. Well, yeah, when you look at um, trends in the Episcopacy, you're right. When you're looking at um, clergy, I think the male-female ratio has actually held steady, and the proportion of ethnic minorities in the clergy has significant decre significantly decreased over time, like in the last few decades. So, yeah, at the top, we've definitely tried to participate in this notion that we need representation in order to be a, a blended church. But I, I think what we've actually found is as we continue to put token members uh, of given races or, or uh, ethnicities or as we continue to promote people by virtue of these inalienable characteristics rather than merit, um, that it has actually kind of poisoned the well. Um, that that's the case that I would make. But yeah, on on the yeah, good luck trying to become bishop as a white male if you're not gay. All right, let's uh, let's get back into the article. Um, the trial of Bishop Carcano has exposed the worst of the UMC. It's nitpicking hidebound rules, it's mean-spirited infighting, it's preoccupation with minutia, it's lust for power, it's absence of grace. If anything, the trial has shown two major needs the UMC must meet if the church is to have any future at all. Two things. One is conflict resolution skills must become essential for all clergy and lay, prof lay church professionals. Teaching such skills to lay people in congregations would be an added benefit. The time is long past to be nice Methodists. We must learn, as John Wesley stressed, to speak the truth in love with one another. That's actually a biblical reference from Ephesians. Uh, the second thing is every UMC unit should have access to a spiritual director who can receive wounded souls and hold them in care and confidence until the Holy Spirit heals their hurt. Spiritual directors for pastors have been recommended in clergy health reports since the early 2000s, and yet few, if any, such counselors are installed. Spiritual direction is not a function that pastors can perform, given the UMC's current appointment system for fear of vulnerability is being used against clergy. So I, I kind of fundamentally disagree with both of these things. Um, so I, I agree that the United Methodist Church is marked by nitpicking hidebound rules, mean-spirited infighting, preoccupation with minutia, but I would say it's all because of lust for power. Uh, I, I would say that's the root thing that you notice all these other things around, and it's because when you get rid of Episcopal authority, when Episco the Episcopal job becomes elevating others instead of leading as an individual that others gather around, then inevitably what's going to happen is others compete to take the lead. And so uh, there's, there's either returning to a, a firmer authoritarian Episcopal model, or there's going forward to a model that's just kind of a, a Wild West scenario in the conference office where, yeah, you have a bishop, but you can't, they can't really do anything without the consensus, the consent of, of everybody else on board. And if anybody complains along the way, well, good luck. You know, it's just not going to happen. 
So uh, there's also this kind of ridiculous thing that's happening across the West where we just, we've got to have a training for everything, okay? We haven't done conflict well. We need conflict resolution training. No, you just need to grow up. How about that? You know, like we're acting like we've got to invent all these rules. No, people have been working together and getting things done for thousands of years before now. Well, how did they do that? They had a leader that everybody followed to the best of their ability, uh, unless they just became impossible to follow, in which case, you know, <laughs> you kill them or you get rid of them or you outlast them, you know, not in the church. Well, even in the church, I think that's happened. So the killing thing, that's what I was objecting to, but uh, I would never wish that upon a bishop. The, the, the thing, though, is we're talking about, I mean, it wouldn't be fun but you heard me, many of you heard me talk about getting bullied by my bishop. It's his prerogative. It was his prerogative to do that. And I'm fine. It wasn't fun. I wouldn't wish it on most people. But to imagine that that I'd be within my rights to just be damaged and traumatized by that, you know, we've gotten too fragile. As a culture, we've been coddled. And I, I think we will continue to get worse if we keep designating more time and space and personnel and resources to venting and airing grievances and blessing trauma, just grow up and get over it. And I, I know I'm talking to a lot of people who feel very traumatized by a dysfunctional system, but that trauma is caused by the way that we process what's going on. So here's an example. Y'all remember the Boston Marathon bombing? That was what, uh, I want to say 12 years ago, 11 years ago. Um there was a, a trauma study done on that afterwards where they looked at the trauma level of those who were at the actual bombing event versus people who just lived in Boston versus people who just lived uh, uh, around Massachusetts. And what they found was that trauma did not at all correspond with those who were at the actual event. Rather, the source of trauma and how damaged people were by it later was how much of the news they watched. And that's not to say that the use, news is uniquely damaging. That's to say that when we make room for hysteria and damage and angst and anxiety, that our spirits make room for that. And we allow ourselves to get warped when we make room for that stuff. So whenever I say grow up, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning don't make room for that damage and rot to set in. Be proactive about how you process dysfunctional people and environments around you. And sometimes that means you need to leave because it's it's untenable and it's unhealthy. That's why I got out of the United Methodist Church. Other times that means that you got to keep your head down and, and dig in. Sometimes that means you need to fight and that when you lose, you just need to accept that you lost. These are all lost skills. And instead, people whine and cry and then compete in the court of public opinion about who's the bigger victim that is a miserable future. We do not want to go there. Um, the oppression Olympics, uh, please, God help us, no. The global Methodist church cannot be about that. That's That was my main concern. If you ever saw my interview with Beth Caulfield, I read her book, uh, People Throw Rocks at Things That Shine. She got abused by Bishop Scholl, much worse than I got abused by my bishop. And she doesn't say that word trauma or anything, and she doesn't play the victim as hysterically as uh, the, the people I was talking about. But she is of the mind that we can create in the GMC a structure that protects people, holds people accountable um, better than the UMC. And I'm of the mind that the more structure you create, the more those with power will use it against those without power. So I'm of the mind that you have to have high Episcopal authority. They can do what they want, but everybody sees what they do and everybody hears what they say. So if there's one thing, if there's one legislative thing I could put before the GMC right now, it would be, I think every single meeting that the bishop, any bishop has should be recorded. If not with video, then at least with audio. Recorded, filed, duplicated, sent to whoever was in the meeting. That should be just a part of the job description of every administrative assistant. And that if anybody doesn't want to be recorded, they should not be in ministry. Um, that, that if we want to be saying things in private that nobody can summon later, we just can't have them in ministry. If people need their stuff to be private in order to do ministry, uh, 
we just say, nope, not in the global Methodist church. I would love it if that just becomes part of the ethos. I, I, I don't know how many people receive that well. I'm seeing some comments come up, so let me look at these. Um, Lewis Smith made a joke. Hispanics can be of any race. Look at the Astros lineup. I, I wish I knew that joke. I'm just not watching baseball. Um, why do we not realize that the UMC is a middle class, just a little less than Presbyterians and Episcopalians? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I would say we're upper middle class. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what, it, what we can rightly draw from that, I think, would be debatable. But yeah, I think that's true. Paul says, have Argentinian and Venezuelan friends, and they are white. Uh, was there ever a call for all parties to meet in prayer together before a trial? You know, I don't know, Paul. Um, I know that they had to seek a just resolution. So uh, according to the structure presented there, um, they, they had to have some kind of mediator go between the complainants and the respondent and see if they could come to an agreement about how to move forward together and that, that couldn't happen. They, they could not find common ground, and so that's why it happened. Whether or not, I've experienced, and to his credit, you know, I wasn't real impressed with Bishop Gwynn, who uh, presided over the proceedings, but one of the things he had wisdom about was he didn't pray with the jurors before they went because he didn't want to augment their thinking process as he went through, and then he didn't want to have communion once the verdict was announced because he knew... I don't remember his exact wording, but he knew that it would be phony and potentially do harm. One of the weird things about me, um, a lot of global Methodist leadership that I've been in contact with and done uh, some basic ministry with has been they want to pray together a lot. And I found that that's really hard for me to do in earnest with people I don't know very well. And I know that we all didn't like the United Methodist Church, but that's not enough for me to feel like, our, okay, okay. She and I are worshiping the same God, and we are petitioning Him in prayer. And it's, it's, I, I get that we're supposed to pray, but prayer is a very intimate thing. Communion is a very intimate thing, um, and so it, it seems you know whenever there's this level of disagreement, are we serving the same God? I, I think those people got to the conclusion that that. Yeah, at the point that you're filing a complaint and publicly having this woman removed from her job, at that point prayer becomes, um, I think that would be an unhealthy thing to do. I could be wrong. I mean, uh, put it in the comments if y'all, whatever you think about that. I'm, I'm interested, but a lot of times things seem phony, if not harmful, if the intimacy is not already in place. Um, DJ says, not sure about the recording, but at least somebody taking notes similar to how notes are taken in council meetings. Weird thing about that, in the trial, Shinya Goto was the uh, secretary, note taker, and um, didn't get notes in on time. They would be adopted later, and they wouldn't always resemble what they had talked about. But, you know, if you've ever been in a meeting, very rarely do people comb through with a fine tooth comb and, and correct things. But Stacy Current, was able from the program they uploaded it to to see that he actually got on even after they approved it, long after they approved it, and edited notes. She couldn't see what he edited, but she could see that he edited things, and she took screenshots and submitted them to people. So just because there's someone designated to take notes does not mean that they're going to be good notes or faithful notes. The only reliable thing that we have is just recording video and audio, and it is not hard with the smartphones that we have. I know it feels kind of phony or technical or cold, uh, but it really is such a blessing to have these things. And if it just becomes part of the culture, then it doesn't have to be this, what, you're, you're recording me? Like, do you not trust me? Although I would love it if as an institution, the GMC says, nope, we do not trust one another. <laughs> That's what did the UMC in. We're going to watch over one another in love. That would be wonderful. I, I don't know if the leadership is mean enough to say that sort of thing. Jeff Pospis just says, uh, remember all the prayer that went into General Conference 2019? Me and the leadership in the Dakotas took it seriously, but judging from the results, some may have been using it as a ploy to soften the other side. 
Yeah, it seemed really disingenuous. I mean, 2019 was such a, a heinous thing in so many ways. Um, but 2019 was also an example of the insufficiency of we need to do better. You know, they were so dissatisfied by it for so long. If we just pray enough, if we just keep talking, we'll figure something out. No, sometimes things just don't fit together, and you need to have the discernment to see that. DJ says, true, I admit I take the notes in the council meetings, and it's difficult to keep up. Oh, I, I, I wasn't making a dig at you, but it's wonderful that you have humility. Yeah, um, uh, Richard says, you are completely right. Notes are not enough. I love being right. You can tell me that anytime. Um, I'm checking the time. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Let's see if we can't at least close out one article today. Um, finally, the Council of Bishops should censure its colleagues in the Western jurisdiction for the cruel and unusual punishment of Bishop Carcano's extraordinary 19-month suspension with its attendant secrecy. The council itself bears a large measure of responsibility for how horribly their colleague has been treated by not having intervened when it had the chance. It should repent, if not publicly, then at least within the closed doors of its executive sessions. So when it's talking about colleagues in the Western jurisdiction, I think the author is talking about the other bishops of the Western jurisdiction, which would be, I mean, so Rapinoet and um, Escobedo Frank didn't step in until recently, and they seem to have helped this thing get on the, this show get on the road. Um, Bridgeforth hasn't done any or said anything that I'm aware of. Olivito um, seems to have dragged her feet. Whether she enjoyed doing so, I can't say. I don't know anything about that. But uh, she she seemed to have slow walked this. And then Elaine Stanofsky stepped in for Carcano and seemed to have reversed a lot of her decisions and began a public venting process where people got to vent just all kinds of nasty stuff in the name of healing, which I think was calculated. So, yeah, I think they owe her an apology if they did these things. It would be awesome if they did it publicly. I can't imagine any world in which that happens. Back to the article, Bishop Carcano described her suspension as banishment, and that's what it was. She testified in open court that she was prevented from any contact, not only with Cal Nevada Conference, but she was also supposed to refrain from attending worship in UM congregations and was chastised twice when she attended the funerals of longtime friends. She was, well, she didn't just attend. She did officiate in some capacity. But even so, it's a bit heartless. She was subjected to surveillance. She was isolated and physically guarded at the Western Jurisdiction Conference in November 2022. She was expelled from the solace of her church at the moment of her greatest agony. And I think that's mostly true. I, I think it seems to me that Carcano could have engaged in a faith community outside of the United Methodist Church. You know, she says she went this whole time without having communion. I think that's very unwise to go that long without communion. I would have had her attend an Episcopalian church or some other fellow. You know, heck, I would have had her go to a global Methodist church. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I don't know that there are any out there. But um, to go that long and just say the United Methodist Church is the only church for me and they've cut me off and I have no community, it felt like unnecessary self punishment. Um, so I, I would like to think that wasn't for effect and for drama, um, but surely she doesn't think that the United Methodist Church is the only denomination that has Jesus. Last paragraph. In short, after a lifetime of service to the church, Minerva Carcano has been chewed up and spit out by an institution drunk on power and imprisoned by an anachronistic rule book for possible infractions that have never hampered a white male bishop if there's any good that comes out of this fiasco, we might take the lessons from this shameful affair and make it, make the United Methodist Church better because of it. Hey, you know, that is my prayer too, as I, uh, you know, have been talking through this and, and praying through this. I hope, I hope that the United Methodist Church does get clear on some of these things. It was funny that, that, that Wesleyan quadriliberal person on Twitter saw me uh, doing one of my live streams and, and processing it and said, well, he's processing it, but coming to all the wrong conclusions. And so, you know, it's it's possible that we all look at the same thing and come to completely opposite conclusions. I think, you know, I mean, part of that's human nature, and then part of that's just the sickness of the United Methodist Church as it's continued to drift more and more in a certain direction, and things get worse and worse in myriad ways. 
they just imagine it's because they're not doing it enough. Um, they're not, they don't have enough mental health provisions. They don't have enough conflict uh, healing training. They don't have enough uh, dialogue and collaboration, you know, all of these things that, you know, bishops just 30 years ago would have rolled their eyes at, you know. Um, they, they think that they know what the right side of history is and what the future looks like, and even though it never seems to work out, it's just because they're not doing it hard enough and because people like me just won't get on board. You know, if, if I would just get with the program, then it would all work, uh, which is, of course, you know, why communism never worked as well, right? Um, so uh, Brian asks, how can someone be banished from attending a funeral? Yet she was not banished from attending a funeral. She was banished from leading in any capacity. She attended funerals of friends where... Uh, she was asked to say a closing benediction in one, and she did, and she got a slap on the wrist for it. And then she uh, officiated a whole funeral service for another friend and and got called out on it. But, um, yeah, it's one of those things that f feels like it's not a big deal, but if, like, if she'd been, like, a serial rapist or something, and then she was up there pretending to be a holy person in the name of the United Methodist Church, that would be a big deal. You know, I mean... Whew. If she had been a char uh, charged with raping some people, oh my gosh, you know, this should have gone a different direction. But no, it's, oh, she used some money inappropriately. Well, did she pocket any of it? No. Um, is the money all going back to where it started? Yeah. Was it used for things that are now benefiting a local church? Well, yeah. Okay, wait, where's the outrage supposed to be? You know, oh, she, uh, mm, she made a committee make a decision. Well, had it been a long time? Well, yes. The people that were dragging their feet, did they do it inappropriately? Well, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's just all these... What What else is she supposed to do? I'm sure she was unpleasant. I'm sure she's got a, a big ego. That seems to be something that people routinely per, uh, report. <laughs> You're going to remove her and none of the other bishops? It just seems silly. And now you've wasted probably... a. I mean, when you look at all the money that this has probably cost her conference, it's it's easily over a million dollars. Over people's egos. That's just so silly. Um, R. Gabe Davis, all Christians need to watch over each other and hold each other accountable and record if necessary. We should trust each other to be descendants of Adam and Eve. Oh, yes, yeah. One of my favorite portions in the Bible I mean, it's so mean. Jesus was so mean. I don't know why everybody thinks he was nice. He's talking to these Pharisees, and they're talking about how they are children of Abraham, and he says, I know who your father is. It's not Abraham. You're children of the devil. <laughs> he's just so mean. I mean, he's speaking the truth in love, I'm sure, but I mean, it's not like anyone's going to receive that and go, oh, you're right, I am, you know? Except, you know, unless they're a penitent sinner, which these guys were not. Uh, but, yeah, this is a nicer way of saying, yeah, we're children of Adam and Eve, which is to say we've inherited their sin and we're inclined towards sinning in that continually. Yeah, Suzanne says, I doubt anyone will repent. You know, and that's the thing. I would love to see a Christian movement slash institution where genuine repentance is the norm. Here in... Uh, the Oklahoma Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, there's a district superintendent who's Korean. I, 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 it feels relevant that he's Korean because he just, when people have that cultural separation, they don't necessarily get infected as badly by the culture war because a lot of it doesn't translate always. And he's clearly, you know, not, not uh, second or third generation. He's first generation. You can hear his accent and just mannerisms are different than Americans. I came into a conference event a year, a year and a half ago where he was praying a prayer of repentance and that guy was actually sorry. It wasn't one of these postured, you know, I don't know if any of you ever saw the thing they did at general conference, like repenting to the Native American tribes, but that th whole thing seemed so phony and contrived, and it just seemed like virtue signaling. Man, this guy, when he was praying, there was nothing phony about it. He was genuinely sorry. Um, if that guy was leading the annual conference, I probably wouldn't have left. 
you know, when, when people actually know how to be sorry, to name their sin, to repent of it, that's really something I'm, I'm drawn to. That's something I need. Man, I hope I'm doing it well in my personal life. But I need that from leadership. And if leadership can't do that because they're too proud or they have an image to maintain, I just can't have that in the church, you know? And even if they can't, you know, that's not to say they should repent of things they're not guilty of, but I think being able to model earnest repentance and a hatred of one's sin and, and faults and failures, that's, uh, that's pretty key. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Suzanne, that, that they probably won't repent and that that is a symptom of an underlying issue that's really quite terrible. Even if, even if repentance is offered, it, uh, they don't know how to do it, do they? DJ says, could this entire case possibly have been overblown by the UMC in order to take attention away from more important matters? Hey, you've, you've learned how the media operates. Um, maybe. I don't know how centralized their propaganda creation machine is. My theory all the way along was that um, uh, she had stood in the way of um, the aspirations of Bridge Forth and Craig Brown. Craig Brown actually worked against her, uh, testified against her, and then um, she had shut down Bishop Olivito's church, Glide Memorial, and so uh, the two, uh, Bridge Forth and Olivito, were bishops, and what I suspect is that they... Uh, fanned the flames of get discontent, assured them that whenever it came uh, to them that, well, Olivito was the main one in control, that they would uh, drag it out and make her look bad and it would be a done deal. There's no way I can confirm this at all, but that's what makes sense of the whole thing to me. It's a personality ego thing between two people in the oppression Olympics whose God is power. Um Richard says bishops always have big egos. That's how they get their jobs. That's why I'm against any system where people promote themselves. People should only ever be nominated, and preferably people who don't want to do it should be compelled to do it. Resurrection. <clears throat> hey, Jeffrey, excited to hear your interview with Daniel T. from Bulgaria. Yeah, we had it this morning. I, I hope to have it up next week. Uh, Daniel Topolsky, fantastic person. Jeff Dollar, I question the whole concept of bishops, considering the word itself is interchangeable with pastor, unaccountable power, even if connected to the church, always corrupts. So uh, half agree, half disagree. Um, 100%, we should never have unaccountable power. All power should be accountable. So we got to be recording everything. Everything should be done in the open. There's just no reason for secrecy. However, it is hotly contested whether or not episkopos and presbuteros, these are the Greek words for overseer and elder, are synonymous or inter and interchangeable, or if they are unique categories of clergy. I'm, I'm of the mind that they are needed in order for doctrinal conformity and discipline, um, but I could be wrong. Paul, if GMC bishops are to be have restricted time in office, their egos may be none or much less. Okay, so Paul is talking about uh, the American political equivalent would be, um, oh heck, what do we call it? Term limits. The notion being that um, the longer that they're in office, just the more that the institutional sickness seeps into their bones and corrupts them and makes them slaves of uh, corrupt ecclesial power. And I think there's something probably real to that. Um, I just think there has to be regular scrutiny, accountability uh, of, of all leadership, and when they give signs that they are enjoying power or abusing power, that they just are removed, you know, that, that, that others are elevated, that they are demoted. You know, I, I think it, a lot of this would actually change if we pay bishops the same as elders, if yeah, I already talked about one agenda item, legislative item I would love earlier. Here's another one. I think bishops should be paid the average of all of the clergy in their region. I just I think the higher payment of bishops is so theologically fraught that it's kind of ridiculous that we do it. Um, R. Gabe Davis, how about giving the locals members a video a day earlier than everyone else? Okay, uh, 
Gabe, you've been with me from the beginning. You've been my, I think, my first supporter. So absolutely, whatever you ask for, I'm going to give you. So tell me, tell me what video you want. I'll give it to you a day earlier. Happily. Thank you for telling me how I complete. I, I, love, I love making people happy. All right, man, um, we're at 5.05. I've gone for an hour and five minutes. There was a lot more that we could have covered that I would have loved to cover. Um, but I like going deep more than covering a lot of ground. So we, we talked about a lot of worthy stuff, I think. Uh, we're going to pray in just a minute. So if you have any prayers you'd like me to say, then go ahead and put them in the comments and uh, I'll read them. Um, Oh, um, Paul, restricted periods, yes, I think they are policies in the Global Methodist Church. I don't think you can be permanent bishops. So if I indicated that that they can be permanent, yeah, I was more talking about like the ideal church. But yeah, the Global Methodist Church definitely has a notion that people can step into bishop, uh, Episcopal office and then step back out. So I'm glad you you followed that up with me. All right. Um all right, uh, in preparing for prayer, we're going to pray for Bishop Carcano, the Cal Nevada Conference, the United Methodist Church. We're going to pray for the Global Methodist Church. And um, yeah, if there's anything else that, that we should talk about, uh, go ahead and write it. I'm going to take the comments off the screen, but I'll, I'll keep watching them on my devices here. All right, let us pray. Holy Lord, we thank you. You've been really good to uh, people like me who discerned that the United Methodist Church was uh, a dysfunctional and toxic place to be. I think that that's been on full display for this week for anyone who's watched this trial, but the fullness of that is, is the fullness of the dysfunction, <laughs> the vast majority of it doesn't happen on camera. It happens behind closed doors private conversations with people that should not be in positions that they're in. So I pray, Father, that you would protect the Global Methodist Church from that. I pray that you would purify your church and all the world. Uh, Christians have splintered into thousands of groups, and many churches have given up on groups altogether, and they just do their own thing. And we know you were not glorified in that, Lord. We pray that you would bring about a spirit of true Catholicity, <laughs> true unity, true desiring to be under mutual covenant and fellowship, but we know that that depends very much on the quality of the leadership, Lord. And so we pray that you would give um, a hunger and a yearning for righteousness and an interest in not shoving church off to the side where we can only give it short shrift, but making it the center of our lives such that many people are watching over one another in love, and it just becomes a place where people can't get away with much, and that the only ones left doing things in positions of authority are those who want to die to self and live for you. The whole history of the, the church in the world has been so discouraging to see just how easily rot sets in and love of money and power corrupts those who are given trust, so we pray that you would help us to do something that very few places and times have been able to manage, and that is to be people who design a polity and participate faithfully that just doesn't make room for evil. Once upon a time, that's what Methodism was. We know that it could be again. We remember that John Wesley yearned for just a few people who desired nothing but you, and feared nothing but your disappointment, and he knew that they would beat back the gates of hell, and we too hunger and yearn for that. We pray that you would make us hunger and thirst for your righteousness above all things. We pray that you would give us a holy fear that from the front and from behind we are moved to go forward such that you would be glorified, not just in each of our lives individually, but that you would do a new thing, a collective thing that that your church and the world would not just be one more institution that has been so thoroughly corrupted and disappointing, but that we might be something pure and good and amazing. Father, glorify yourself in the church, and may we be a part of it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, this was fun. Um, I don't think I missed any prayers being lifted up, so I really enjoy spending my time with you all this way.
let me see if I can, I don't know if I can see how many. We got 42 on YouTube, and I don't think I can see how many are on uh, Facebook. We seem to hold around, we get, I think, a high point each week is like 50, which is not nothing. Uh, but I kind of imagine this growing over time and being just a centralized place for Methodists to get together and uh, me just be a central mouthpiece to say all these crazy things where you normal people can kind of come back and, and have agreement in the middle. And heck, if I can if I can facilitate unity in that way, I'll be happy. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to go have a, a weekend with my wife and kids. And as I said, there's I've recorded, I think, four things now that haven't been aired yet. So I'll, uh, I'll maybe reach out to Gabe and see which one of those I can put out early for supporters on Locals. And then uh, for any of you who, who decide that I, I should get some support and some help, then uh, go back to the beginning of this after it gets published, and you can look at the ways to do that at Locals or on my church website. And I uh, appreciate all the love and support, guys. All right, y'all take care. I'll see you later.